Hi, everybody. Welcome to this CUBE conversation. My friend Chris Lynch is here. He's the executive chairman and CEO of AtScale Investor. Good to see you, man. Thanks for coming in. It's my pleasure. Good to see you, Dave. Yeah, come on, all the way out to Marlboro. <laughs> That's a, the mean streets of Marlboro. I love geez. it. How's your summer been? Um, haven't had a lot of summer between the lousy weather on the Cape and just a lot of work travel. Um, I've got down there a few weekends, just coming back there actually uh, this past weekend. But Labor Day's over, so it's back to school, back to work. We, um, I, I can't remember the summer this busy. I haven't taken any time off. We had three super studio events out in our Palo Alto office, but then I tapped out of Google Next to go to Saratoga, but we did Snowflake, we had Databricks. Obviously you were at Google Next. How, how were those shows for you guys? Um, all, show, all three shows were great for us. Um, I was shocked at the Google show, how well attended it was. It was obviously Labor Day, rolling into Labor Day weekend, uh, which I wasn't thrilled about, but the show was excellent for us. A lot of qualified interest in applied AI, in um, the, the universal semantic layer that obviously we sell at at scale. And um, unlike a lot of shows, there weren't a lot of people just collecting charge keys. There were a lot of people that were coming in that had projects uh, they were thinking about how they could deploy, you know, a next generation stack to replace their SASS stuff. And so it was a great show for us. So you were Databricks growth partner of the year, is that right? Uh, their emerging partner of the year, right. yes. Okay, meaning what? Smaller companies that are- I think out, out of the startup community, we, we were their best partner. And then, and then BigQuery partner or what, what, what do you guys do? We, with we, we're, we're a Google partner, and, um, but we also won an award for, um, I think it was even further segmented because they've got a lot of partners, but um, we did get an acknowledgement out there. And um, more importantly, we got a lot of qualified leads and prospects. Oh, that's good. And so let's see, uh, last year, so uh, Alex, you got to bring up the, the picture. Last year with Tech Tackles Cancer in Boston, you know, we have you on the right here, beautiful. Um, yeah, your shirt was still on at that point in time. Of course, on the left, we see that you can actually get cleaned up beautifully. And uh, so Tech Tackles Cancer this year was May in London, right? And you're doing it again in November in Boston? Yes, what, November. What's that all about? What's the change yeah. in venue? So no November 7th in Boston, same location that we had the summer before um, at the Sinclair in Harvard Square. And I think tickets are already on sale. Uh, we're still adding sponsors. So if you're interested in being a sponsor or a singer, um, you know how to get a hold of me, chris.lynch at atscale.com, you know, or get, get a hold of me through LinkedIn. But um, the last show was in London because the charity is a global charity. So the research we support is for cancer research, uh, researchers, we fund researchers around the world through our organizations, um, and we dispense the care obviously around the world. So it's a global organization. And I felt like to make that point, because I don't want to be associated exclusively with me or Boston, because it's way bigger than that. It's about the tech community, which is global, right? And opportunities for us to build the muscle memory of giving back. This is one cause of many that we could get behind. Um, but that it's global. So we did it in support of Cancer UK, which is uh, Princess Diana's started that foundation. And we had a show at the Omera in London. And um, I think we raised 120 or 130,000 pounds in our first night there. It's not bad. And, and it wasn't bad for a first night. And um, it was a great show. Well, it was a great show in Boston. I, mm -hmm. I, when I, I, first time I went was last summer. And we were doing a lot of the previews here out of the studio. Um, we did a lot of remotes just to pump it up. But and it was billed as um, live karaoke, uh, live band karaoke, but it's not karaoke. You guys are actually singing. <laughs> I mean, correct. And, and the talent is good. I and mean, it's not like karaoke. You go to a karaoke bar, you're like, oh, enough. But um, you had a lot of bands, you had, you had folks from HPE. Pure, obviously you, Steve Duplessis, and you know dozens of people. It was it was actually quite amazing. So congratulations on getting that off the ground. Thank you, thank you. Well, we we have <coughs> excuse me, we have big big aspirations. Um, we're planning on doing another show in London. We've been invited by our partner at Google in Madrid to do a show. So I'm looking forward to that. 
And, um, you know, we expect to move to every theater around the world eventually. Great, great cause. So the Cube Global will follow you around. So <coughs> let's talk a little tech. So, you know, this AI craze is, is obviously going down. A lot of hype. You've seen a lot of hype cycles before. You know, you're kind of AI meets the semantic layer. Um, what do you, first of all, what do you make of, you know, people like AI was invented in November, 2022. You know, we know it's been around for a long time. You've been talking about AI since the big data gate days. Um, but what My do you make of this? My understanding is that Al Gore invented it. <laughs> just ask him. Yeah. <laughs> Add that to his, his, another notch on his belt. Yeah. The internet and AI. What would we do without so, him? Right. We so, got the internet from him. Right. We got global warming from him. And we got AI from him. <laughs> so, so what do you make of this, uh, this latest hype? Is, is, is Gen AI, I mean, it's obviously amazing. You use ChatGPT, it, it's mind blowing what it can do. Uh, but how, how as, a, as an entrepreneur and as an executive, how do you think it's changed the way in which people are going to be thinking about technology and investing in technology? So I'd answer a couple of ways. First of all, the way I think of at scale, we're the bridge between BI, traditional BI and AI. And under that semantic layer, at the end of the day, Dick Egan used to have a, have a saying. They used to say to all the salespeople at EMC, and I know, I know your connections there. He used to say, it's about the software stupid, <laughs> right? When they thought like, hey, this is all us, right? And really about the software they built and their product. Right. Well, I stole that. You know, the Egan's are investors in at scale. Um, so I got licensed to steal it, but I say it's about the data stupid. So AI, generative AI, machine learning, at the end of the day, it's all about the data. The software is only going to be as valuable as its ability to leverage and understand the data. So what do I think is happening? I think in the marketplace, straight up AI plateaued about two years ago because we ran out of smart people to sell it to. It was smart people selling to smart people. That's a small market, right? The big markets are dumb people like me selling to dumb buyers like me. What I mean by that is, right, that you don't have to be a data scientist. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. Right When mere mortals can leverage the technology, can absorb the technology, that's when it becomes a big market. So I think, to answer your question, I think we're you know, not even out of the first inning of the power of these technologies. And we'll accelerate that power as we gain understanding of business context, of decision context. And data provides that, the data that, for instance, an at scale universal semantic layer would deliver. So we definitely have a, a dog in the fight and we want to see applied AI growing because that's where applied AI delivers value. We've got two phenomenons we've hit. One, early days of a technology, limited ability for consumers to absorb it and use it and gain value. So we plateaued because we got it in the hands of all the smart people, but not all the people that do the work, not all the people that are making all the decisions, right? Sort of the people in the corner, right? The one percenter brains, right? And it's obviously that has some value, but when it's ubiquitous is when it changes the world. So how is that going to happen? It's going to happen but in a market where no one's got an appetite to experiment. Everyone's hiding under the table right? Everybody wants ROI. Everybody wants lower churn. Everybody wants customer growth, right? Everybody wants cost savings. Applying these technologies to that is how we're going to gain traction and ubiquity. Gen AI, it's not going to solve all the problems. And today it's in that hype cycle of it can do everything and anything, which means it won't do anything unless we focus it on the basic use cases of today where they can be leveraged very simply, very directly in a con controlled and confined manner while the rest of us catch up with the power of the technology. 
while the regulators catch up with the power of the technology, right? So we set up the guardrails, we set up, right? Imagine the Wild West if instead of horses and buggies, everybody had a 911 and a Ferrari. No roads, no lights, right? We would have already wiped ourselves out as a human race. <laughs> well, we could do the same thing with this stuff if we don't figure it out. So it's kind of like a kid playing with a nuclear weapon, right? He might hit Moscow. Can I say that? Oops. Or he might blow his foot off, right? Technology is super powerful, right? Have we matured and developed to be able to take advantage of it, apply it to do good? Well, your point about, you said, you know, dumb people like, like us, right? What you mean by that is people that, you know, don't necessarily, you may be able to code. I can't code anymore. But the point I want to make is, and unpacking a lot of what you said is, in tech, at least in the most recent cycles, it's been the consumer piece that drove the uptake and then eventually seeped into the enterprise and changed the economics. And it looks like the same thing's happening here. Like you say, you know, AI was like smart people selling to smart people. And we even saw this in the data, the spending data. It started to wane coming out of the pandemic. And then of course, after ChatGPT, it's gone back up. But the consumer uh, applications are what's got it all started, what made it ubiquitous. And then the other thing is when you think about the internet, the power law of the internet, which a lot of people have written about, it was like, you know, five or six companies dominate and, and then they get most of the volume and then there's a huge long tail. And it seems like something similar has happened here, but different. I want to get your opinion on this. So you're going to have the big AI models, the LLMs from, you know, Meta and, and OpenAI and Microsoft and Google and, and Amazon, but then you have and maybe Cohere and some of those other guys, but then you're going to have a long tail of applied AI that's very domain specific. So maybe it's the size of model by, by domain specificity, and you're going to have a lot of those that are very unique, very highly tuned. What do you think about that? So I see AI platforms, mm -hmm. AI infrastructure, and then I see applied AI, which to me are apps. So it's a stack. And I it's a stack ultimately, right? As the markets grow, but this is a game of girth. You're building chips, yeah. right? You're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars of investment in time. You're talking about building, right? One of these massive platforms, hundreds of millions of dollars in time. Building domain use case specific applied AI apps, anybody can do it, thanks to the cloud vendors, the hyperscalers, yeah. ironically, right? So, so they are giving birth to thousands of companies that will be in this AI ecosystem that are building applications that frankly, at some level, disintermediate the hyperscalers. So in my opinion, what will happen is once there's enough traction here, because this train has left the station, the platforms are here. As the applications catch up and the users catch up, you're going to see a consolidation of what we've seen in every industry, vertical integration. So those applied AI companies are going to get swallowed up by the platform players who are going to be fueled and funded by the infrastructure players. So I bring this back to, to Atscale. So we uh, have been working um, to develop George Gilbert, myself, the rest of the team, Rob Streche, kind of build a model of the future of data apps. And the premise is basically, we, we used Uber uh, as an example, where you have people, places, and things, riders, drivers, ETAs, destinations, fares, those are all data elements and they're, they're incoherent, but Google basically wrote their own semantic layer to make them coherent. Well, it's great if you got 3000 engineers and they're all geniuses, but the, the average company can't do that. So they need uh, an off the shelf horizontal technology that they can apply to their business so they can inform their business in real time. And they need a semantic layer to do that. So first of all, does that premise make sense that that Uber for the enterprise is where the, the future of data apps is going and how does the semantic layer fit in as a horizontal platform? So, it's in my interest to say this, so I'll qualify, but I do agree with your thesis um, as it relates to the, the Uber analog. Um, and I believe that it means that 
a universal semantic layer is a requirement because it's that grid, it's that highway, right? So I think by definition, it happens. It has to be universal. We're multi-cloud, we're hybrid cloud. That's important part of this because, you know, different workloads are optimized for, for different platforms and different technologies. And you have to recognize the speed at which we can absorb AI technology, right? One is understanding the domain and use case, but the other is there's a legacy of any, any organization that's existed for the last five years is built on data. Last 10 years, even more, right? So think about the Fortune 5000. How many of them are riddled with silos of data that they can't connect, that they can't look at in a complete way in their own organization? And none of them can, can share it and look at inside their supply chains or their ecosystems. We make data a product. We allow you to make it a service, your data. You don't have to be in the data business. Guess what? Everyone is in the data business. And we allow that data to be monetized, external and internal to organizations. But that requires a universal semantic layer. It's not enough to say, okay, we can stitch our stack together. Nobody wants one stack from one vendor. That's so 1980s. Well, but this is the thing too, is those different data products or data elements that I was describing, you, you, a semantic layer essentially makes them coherent elements that can be coordinated in real time. Correct. And so data's coming in that informs the state of your business and actually with AI can take action on that business without necessarily human involvement. I mean, obviously there's going to be humans involved in many decisions, but humans don't have to be involved in every decision. A human's not involved in every little decision that's going on behind the Uber app. You, know, you, can, you can cancel, you can change, you can whatever, yeah. uh, but, but you're not, you're, a human is not updating the ETA in real time. You know, the system is doing that right. and that's in, enabled by that, that coherence. So that's a very powerful concept. But you said something interesting, you know, nobody wants just a single stack because you see an interesting battle going on now between Snowflake, Databricks, I would say Google absolutely is in that mix. Microsoft. Microsoft and, and Microsoft and AWS obviously because they're 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 big, not because of their tech stack necessarily. Right. I think Microsoft, you know, data stack is OpenAI and Databricks and some of their own stuff. AWS is this collection of stuff that they've developed over the years, but still very powerful. But Microsoft tooling. announced recently that they're going to compete against their great partner, Databricks. Well, Microsoft competes about against all of its partners. But what, right? I'm, so. but what I'm suggesting is they think that they're going to deliver every element of the stack. Yeah. Because they want to connect it to, right, their antiquated stack, but they've got obviously, you know, 450,000 SASS customers, so they got a lot to protect, but the world's changed. Yeah, and, and so, well, it's been an interesting point about Databricks, because they, basically Databricks was the Microsoft strategy Correct. for years. I mean, a lot of the VMs were running Databricks, you know, inside of Azure, and now you got to, then the open AI comes in, and it was kind of a shot across that bow. Yeah. So that's an interesting sort of dynamic there. So. I mean, I would think the semantic layer unifies all that, those different data elements. So it's a key strategic linchpin for the, for the future of, of, of data apps. How would you play this as an investor um, right now? You're seeing, you know, a lot of the later stage call it, let's say what, series C, guys looking for C rounds, yeah. maybe even B rounds that weren't native AI or obviously having some trouble you know, maybe the early stage valuations are down, so VCs are falling all over themselves to get into the AI game. Um, I'm not sure a lot of them know what they're doing. Uh, you know, you, you yeah. would have a better take on that than I, but how would you play this as an investor right now? Would you wait? Would you spray and pay, uh, pray and spray? So, I think starting, I think it's a great time to start a company because they think as an investor, I won't call them, I don't think valuations are low. I think they are more realistic mm -hmm. from an investor perspective. From a 
entrepreneur perspective, the way I always look at these things, it's about the numerator and the denominator. And it's only about that when you can pay me in hard currency. Right. So I don't worry about value as the entrepreneur. What I worry about is capitalizing the company to the next phase of its maturity so that the company's making progress, right? And it's value. Hitting your milestones. Yes. Delivering incremental in value. Manner. Whatever the market's going to give you, the market's going to give right. you is your point. So I think it's a great time to start a company. And by the way, you're not selling into this headwinds because you're building a product, right? And in any sort of disruption, economic disruption, socioeconomic disruption, right? Global disruption creates opportunity. Industry disruption. So I think it's the greatest time there ever was until the next time to start a company because you have, you're surrounded with disruption. You're, around, you're surrounded with hyperscalers that let you build the infrastructure required in a matter of minutes, hours, mm. to start developing your product. And you're not gonna have to sell to anybody for 12, 14, 18 months, and probably not for 36 months before you gotta start making quarters and stuff. So it's a great time to build a company because also customers are paying attention, they're interested. Right. If you get an idea that can make or save her money to the front of the line, they'll vet, they'll give you access to the use cases, their domain, because they're desperate, right, to find how do they do more with less, like everybody in difficult economic times. And you can compress the time. It's way cheaper now. So great time to start a company. If you're a company like AtScale, you're in that middle ground, you know, it's harder, right? It's definitely harder. Deals take longer. The bar. ROI bar is higher, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And financing those companies is also harder because the valuations have, have come down so much, right? In the period, you know, la last period of time. Now, com companies that are in growth mode and need cash, and the last time they raised was in that win, you know, that 24-month bubble. bubble, you know, they've got to be prepared for a recap or a down round, and everyone just has to, again, remember what I said at the beginning. In my mind's eye, it's about the numerator and the denominator, right? So spend it like you, it's yours, because it is yours. So raise less, do more with less, be disciplined about it, because it caught, you know, because there's no free lunch. And accept that at the end of the day, your number one job is to capitalize the company, to execute on the opportunity. And that might mean you're going to raise $100 million if you're one of these unicorns without the horn these days. And you're going to raise it at a lot less than you raised around two years ago, even though maybe your metrics are better. But you got a 30x multiple before, and you're going to get a five now. Yeah, the two-edged two sword of metrics, right? Because uh, you're saying before, when you're, when you're a startup, you don't have to worry about the metrics, you know, other than hitting your milestones and getting the product done, et cetera. But once you actually have revenue, it's like, what's your cat to LTV? And what's well, your retention we, rate? And if you seed a company, you're investing in the people, you're investing in the market opportunity, and to a lesser degree, the product concept, right? But, but it's a concept, it's a slide deck if you're the first check in, right? So I bet on the people and I bet on the market. Yeah, and great that. people in great markets through trial and error, through execution, figure the rest out. How do you size that up? And a lot of venture capitalists and investors would say, I want to bet on guys that have done it before. Is that a criterion for you as an investor or is it more you get to know the person, you look him or her in the eye and you say, okay, this person has what it takes. The market's there, they're smart, they're trustworthy, they're fun to work with. How do you, do you, do you require sort of prior proof because a lot of young entrepreneurs are like uh, you know i can't get you know the, the traction with the vcs because i haven't done it before it's like all right well then maybe find a mentor that has done it before how do you feel about that so I, i'm going to start with um it's about 10 years ago maybe more i did the commencement speech at bentley how do you like me and now? i start yeah yeah how do you like <laughs> me now but one of the things that i 
that I said was, um, and I forgot where I found it, but I couldn't attribute it to anybody, but it's not mine. Um, professionals built the Titanic. Amateurs built the ark. So I look for character, tenacity, will, intellectual honesty. And you can find out those things from people, even if they haven't started a company before. It takes those things, in my opinion, to start a company. Um, but the way I find it is I meet people everywhere and I look for people that aren't perfect. I look for people that have had setbacks in life because all the startups I've been involved in have failed multiple times, even though they've all ultimately succeeded. So I understand that it's how you respond to failure, to setbacks. That's probably the single most important factor in whether you're going to be successful as an entrepreneur or not. So I look for, look for people that have had stuff happen in life that they could have externalized it and said, I'm here because this happened to me. My parents got divorced. My dad died. The dog died. I didn't, they love my older brother more, right? Unsuccessful people externalize. Successful people internalize. I want to ask you about that. Um, because you, 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 you are a hardo. You can be, you know, tough, I'm sure, to work for. But on the other hand, people have always said to me, I know where I stand with Chris. Um, he lays it down. This is what he expects of me. If I deliver, we're going to be good. Yeah. If I don't, he's going to tell me. I told you, if you don't deliver, you're going to be gone. So I want to come back to something you said about externalizing and internalizing. You have said before you'd rather be lucky than good. You know, you happen to be both. Um, but okay, that's cool. But I'm, I want to ask you about attitude uh, because something you said before, a lot of times unsuccessful people will blame others for their failures and it causes them to give up, to lose that persistence. How were you over to, because everybody gets negative thoughts put into their, their heads and somehow you've got to succeed in pushing them out. How, how did you do that? How did you create that sort of positive flywheel in your life? And did that lead to your success? I think early in my life, I had some personal tragedies that I didn't have the luxury of, you know, I lost my mother in a tragic way and I was the oldest and I had a lot of responsibilities that related to that. And um, I didn't have a chance to think about it or feel sorry for myself. I just had to do it for my other siblings my dad, my family. So I think circumstance gives you that opportunity. Sounds weird to call it an opportunity, but I think that everything in life happens to you can be a gift. You just got to figure, you got to figure it out, right? And if your first reaction is that you're going to use it for an excuse for everything you do in your life, then one, you don't think that much of your life. And two, you don't get what life's about. Because like nobody exists that doesn't go through some heartache. Like we all say we have our, you know, I grew up Irish Catholic. You know, they used to have that saying, everyone has their crosses to bear, right? I do think everyone has their crosses to bear. It's called being human, right? And just the circle of life stuff tells you, right? We watch Disney cartoons, every single one of them, the old people die. Well, guess what? Because old people are going to die, whether it's in a kid's cartoon, right? It's just, it is the circle of life. So you're going to experience tragedy. You're going to experience setbacks. People who are happy, take those on. They put them on their shoulders. So I just learned at a, a young age that like, if something get, you know, is in front of me, um, it's a challenge for me. And I like people and I look for people and I listen to people and I look for people that have had stuff happen in their life, but they're positive and they never use it as an excuse. Like in my company, if we have a bad quarter, you're never gonna hear me or anybody who continues to work for me say, well, it's the economy, the market crashed, right? It's global warming, it's Russian Ukraine. Unless you have 100% market share. Right? You know, it's us, right? Because we all play in the same world. 
with the same frailties as human beings, and some of us figure it out. They learn how to walk and chew bubble gum at the same time, and some don't. And you got to own it. And people who own it, right, they do the best in life, right? Are you a planner? Like, do you, like, plan, like, meticulously write your plans down and just kind of manifest them? Or do you just sort of visualize what you want to have happen and go get it? The latter. But I'm not recommending my, <laughs> my, say. <laughs> my style for anything. But I'm, I'm not super detail-oriented. And um, I'm precise and I watch details. But I surround myself with people that capture them. Right? So for me, I'm more, I visualize things. And then I sort of direct and lead in that, in that way. And then I do the pattern matching of where I want to go. And do I think this thing or this thing is going to help me get there? Or do I think like they may end up on my flank and they're, you know, negative, right? Then I'm directing based on that saying, okay, what is that? Starboard? Whatever that is. I told port. you I don't know how to swim. That's port. Port. <laughs> you know, we head to the port. Maybe we got to, you know, shoot one of our nuclear submarine bombs after him. I don't know. But the idea is I always keep optionality and I'm staying at a level where I'm watching everything, but at a high enough level that I can adjust because small adjustments I make end up for everyone that I work with, bigger adjustments depending on what's happening. What about the people that you surround yourself with? I forget who it was the other day. I was listening to somebody who was described, maybe by some podcast, described as like a, a, a self-made, I think this person was a billionaire, I can't rem remember, like a self-made. And this individual said, I wasn't self-made. I relied on so many other people, mentors, people that could fill gaps and skills that I didn't have, you know, other capabilities. I mean. I, somebody could look at you and say, you're self-made, um, extremely successful. Um, but what would you say to that? Did you, did you build like, a, like an inner circle or what some call a mastermind alliance? And did you rely on that? How did that affect your, your growth in your career? Well, I don't, I don't think anybody by that definition is self-made. Right. Right. Because I don't think anybody comp accomplishes anything of substance on their own, right? And it takes a lot of people to execute. The bigger the idea, the more people it takes to execute. So I don't think anybody does anything alone. Um, I think for me, I surround myself because I do think I'm self-aware. I surround myself with people that compliment me, right? And I'm secure enough as a 60 year old dude that, you know, I'm not worried about anybody being better than me. I've always surrounded myself with people that are better than me. And as long as, you know, they spell my name right on the check, I'm okay with it, <laughs> right? So from my perspective, it's about knowing who you are, right? And how to get the best out of yourself and surrounding yourself with opportunities that do that for you um, and people that do that for you. But like, if I thought about like, if I was winning a Grammy, 100%, the first place I'd start, are my folks and my family. What did they teach me that made me a success in business? I grew up poor in a house full of love, so I never equated money with happiness. I equated love and people with happiness. So I don't chase money, money chases me. I chase interesting people solving interesting problems, right? So if I didn't have that, I wouldn't be here, right? I've been working since I was seven. I didn't know until I was almost an adult, that that was a source of supplemental income for the family. I had 300 customers. I learned more about business on that paper out. I had to go pick up the papers. I had to deliver the papers. I had to collect the money for the papers. It was a story of the guy who stiffed you when you were a little kid. Yep. Right? I don't think you Not ever, for long. I don't think, I don't know where I heard that story. You didn't tell it to me, but I heard it. Somebody told me that story. Yeah. So. so, I mean, I learned real lessons to, you know, chase adults, for my money and my tip. Stiffed you, but you got it back. Yeah, of course. As a, how old were you? I was probably, I don't know, 10 or 11. Yeah. yeah. You know, but all those experiences and then all the people that I've worked with, all the mentors, going back to like 
I learned how to build a culture from Ken Olson, Paul Severino, mm -hmm. right? You know, I was part of commercializing not just the internet, but the web with Chang Wu, right? Chang Wu. Was one of so mentors. like, you know, yeah. at the end of the day, you know, and then, you know, you know, like the guy that I walked in the door here with, right? There are so many people that I've worked with. I mean, many of the people I work with, either in my direct company or my investments, have worked with me 20, 30 years. A lot of loyalty. I mean, loyalty is obviously very important to you. That's, that's clear. But you, and you've been able to, to attract people to stay with you um, kind of no matter what. And so, Chris Lynch, amazing. Thank you. I mean, it's kept you for so long, but I uh, appreciate you coming out here. Um, I know you're super busy and, uh, and it's always great to sit down with you. Well, you thank you. I feel the same. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. All right. And thank you for watching this uh, CEO conversation with amazing friend, investor, brother, Chris Lynch. We'll see you next time. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE.